There are two truths in the world today that I wish were falsehoods. The first is that one out of 10 people in the world will go to sleep hungry. The second is that at the same time hunger is such a stubborn problem, we waste over 1 trillion kilos of food per year. By the year 2050, when my son will be nearly the age that I am today, estimates put the world population at about 10 billion people. That's 2 billion new family members, friends, and neighbors. If then, as now, one in 10 people go hungry, that's about 1 billion people around the world. At the same time, if the amount of food we waste on a per person basis does not change, that's about one pound or nearly half a kilo of food per person every day. In agrarian economies, most of the food waste occurs early on in the supply chain. In most urbanized economies, it's the consumer doing most of the wasting. But not every consumer wastes food. Those who are going hungry are not wasting food. Those who live in societies that use every bit of the plants and animals that sustain them are not wasting food. This means that the people who do waste food are throwing away a lot more than the average. We should take cues from the world around us. Mother Nature is incredibly efficient. She does not waste. Perhaps that is why it's in the nature of mothers to remind us to finish what is on our plates. As father time pulls us into the future, it's about time fathers start reminding us to do the same. Food wastage amidst a shortfall in feeding the world is a problem that should not exist, but it does. One solution would be to grow more food, but that's like fixing a leaky tub by pouring in more water. There are many solutions that are based on wasting less and some of the most advanced technologies in the world will light the way to them. Before I get to those solutions though, I want to share some of my experiences with food and how my practices have evolved. 20 years ago, in January 2002, I get married. The marriage is arranged and my wife and I don't know each other very well. She leaves Asia, the only part of the world she has known, to make a life with me in Chicago on the other side of the planet. We learn from each other, we also learn about each other, and this continues to the present day. Among the more curious traits I observe early on is that each day about an hour before lunch, and each day about an hour before dinner, she says, I'll be right back. And she makes a pilgrimage to the grocery store on the ground floor of our apartment complex. This continues for a while before I ask, why do you go to the grocery store so often? Why not stock up? That's how I've done it in the US. We have a large fridge, we can fill it up and save time. Just make a big list and we'll go together once a week. She says, I think it makes more sense to do it this way. That's how I've done it in India. She and I have very different opinions on the subject and I decide to trust her. This also continues to the present day. So I keep observing her and I notice a few things. First, our fridge is no longer stuffed ever. The number of times I open the fridge only to have something fall on my foot goes to zero. Also, a lot of the produce we do have is not necessarily ready for social media. I call it ugly food, but as my wife reminds me, it tastes the same. There are other benefits. The price of such food is usually lower, and when consumers are more willing to eat non-camera ready food, less is thrown out once it's grown. Second, Though we go to the grocery store at least 10 times more often than before, the amount we spend on food has fallen significantly. And perhaps most visible, my wife wastes nothing. We waste nothing. Up until then, my bachelor years were partly an exercise in transporting groceries from the store shelf to the garbage can, keeping somewhere between one half to two thirds in between and donating the rest to the local landfill. But now, almost everything, every step I take in buying and consuming food is different. In short order, my wife changes how I think about something very important. You guessed that this continues to the present day. And I should add a pro tip I learned from my parents. Never go to the grocery store on an empty stomach. You'll end up buying a lot more than you need. And this will apply in the future when ordering groceries through your favorite app. Have a snack first. Now back to the present with an eye to the future, which I cannot predict, but I can see because I invest in the agriculture and tech sectors. You can see it too. You have a great vantage point here in Asia, from India and Pakistan in the West, to Singapore and Australia and New Zealand, up to China, Japan and Korea. Entrepreneurs are harnessing big data and small machines to reinvent, to create a new and to fix the business models that are revolutionizing the oldest job in the world, securing and distributing food. On farms, 
Sophisticated sensors and wearable technologies are used to monitor the usage of water, the consumption of fertilizers, and the health and locations of livestock. Drones, radar, and LIDAR technologies from above are aiding the monitoring of large-scale farms. Today, the automotive sector employs more robots than any other, about 60% of all industrial robots. Within a few decades, though, it's possible that the number of automated machines used to grow and harvest our food will rival those that build and paint our cars. These technologies are increasingly important on a long-term horizon, given what we know about climate change. And in the very short term, they are important in optimizing resource use, given what we know about current events and their impact on the world's food chain, especially on wheat. Once we leave the farm, we see rapid innovation in the cold chain and in food distribution, all of which results in less waste, better quality food, lower prices, and higher incomes for farmers. In urbanized settings, as we have here in Singapore, most of the waste occurs after food reaches markets and grocery stores. We are fortunate that the pace of innovation at this end is no less. On the consumer side, we move from cold chain to blockchain as entrepreneurs improve food traceability, which leads to greater transparency into the authenticity of what we buy and consume. There is some pushback that servers powering the blockchain will consume more resources than they save, but the evidence for now seems to be on the side of the entrepreneurs. Elsewhere, new types of labels are also helping consumers decide what they can keep and what really does need to go. I am hoping that the moments I have feared for my life after drinking milk on the day after the expiration date are a thing of the past. There is also a revolution underway in how protein is sourced, less animals, more plants. Though I won't advocate for either plants or animals to dominate your menu, we have after all evolved to be omnivores. One thing is clear, we cannot consume our planet to feed our appetites. Earth is not on the menu. We must use our resources more responsibly as we welcome billions of new citizens to the world and sustain it for the ones who are already here. Let's continue. There are companies affixing sophisticated yet inexpensive cameras right above rubbish bins. The lenses identify the food being discarded and simultaneously detect the mass of the loss while computing the price of the waste. Extended use has been demonstrated to lead to more efficient consumption and real savings. We can replicate this at home by taking photos of meals after we're done to keep track of waste. Many of us will have taken and shared photos before our meals. Let's bring some symmetry to the exercise and record how little we've wasted. We are also seeing a proliferation of subscription services driven by data with riders on Swift vehicles driven by electricity that are allowing consumers to replicate my wife's multiple trips to the grocery store. Less carbon emitted into the air and less waste at home. This brings me back to my wife and all that I have learned from her. When I spoke about her earlier, you might have noticed I used only the present tense. The reason is that 199 days ago, I was sitting in a ward on the ninth floor of the Kent Ridge Wing at NUH, waiting for my wife to come back from surgery. Her doctors had found a sizable growth in her abdomen and given her family history, I had been told to prepare for malignancy and, and perhaps quote, a bad outcome after that. But the growth was benign, the surgery was a success and I am happy to report that the frequent visits to the supermarket have resumed. Even if I'm talking about something that has already happened though, I don't like talking about my wife in the past tense because I almost had to. At home, we eat better, we waste less, and we save more, all because of her. This talk was a way for me to thank her for all of that. Husbands have been sending their wives love letters for centuries. This was mine. Now to add a postscript to that letter, I'd like to put some virtual sticky notes on the walls of your memory to help you remember how we can use technology to harvest bits of data to save bites of food. So here are some reminders. Buy what you need when you need it. Eat ugly food. Record not only what you're about to eat, but also what you have not eaten. Pay attention to labels and what they're really telling you. And consider the impact on the planet when you choose what to consume. As the world welcomes billions of new family members, friends, and neighbors, we already know that we need a much bigger dining table. Now we can use technology to make sure that we have the right amount of food to put on it. Thank you.